question. So Stephanie, handing over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining me today to learn more about Biopal and how we are collaboratively developing open source software for ESA's biomass mission. I'd like to start today by um, telling you more about uh, the biomass mission and the challenges we sometimes face here at ESA in operating our um, algorithms that translate raw um, satellite data into data products we distribute um, later on to the public. Um, I'll then go into detail about Biopal and how Biopal could be a solution to these um, challenges we're facing at ESA. Um, I'll show you how open source development in Biopal looks like. I'll share with you a couple of lessons learned in setting up such an open source software project uh, here in the agency. And last but not least, um, I'll tell you how you can get involved yourself um, contributing to Biopal. So first of all, Biomass is ESA's seventh Earth Explorer mission. And ESA Earth Explorer missions are experimental research missions that are dedicated to specific aspects of our Earth's environment, whilst also demonstrating new technology in space. So in other words, these missions really address um, very timely, critical and specific issues raised by our scientific community, while really demonstrating the latest Earth observing techniques. And these experimental missions, if successful, may even evolve into operational miss missions, such as the Copernicus Sentinels, for example. So Biomass, um, you can see the satellite here in particular, is ESA's Global Forest Height and Biomass mission with a primary scientific objective to study the Earth's carbon cycle by measuring and quantifying, for example, global forest structure like forest height or above ground biomass. It's scheduled uh, for launch in February 2023 and in the case of the Biomass Earth Explorer, we are expecting an operational period of about five years in orbit. So with Biomass, uh, we're really at ESA are planning on exploring the unknown, both in uh, terms of research, but also in terms of technology uh, used for the research and in terms of uh, operational procedures uh, we use here in our ground segment. So biomass is the first mission at ESA designed to estimate above ground biomass and to address the role of forests in the global carbon cycle. Biomass is also ESA's first P-band ZAR mission in space, including full polarimetric ZAR and interferometry as mission objectives. And uh, for us here in the ground segment, it is the first time that we have to deliver systematically generated biophysical param parameters, meaning um, systematically generated maps of a global forest biomass, forest height, or for example, forest disturbance. So it's the first time for us that we are developing global operational processing chains for interferometric data from space. And when I talk um, about operational algorithms or operational software, I mean the algorithms, the software, the code uh, that for us translates raw satellite data into level two or level three data products um, that are distributed, for example, such as global maps of above ground forest biomass or forest height. So the novelty of um, all Earth Explorer missions really poses certain challenges for us in developing and operating these processing algorithms within ESA's ground segment. For example, scientists like Maciek Soja or Alberto Lanzo Gonzalez, who are developing the initial prototypes of these scientific uh, processing algorithms, um, before launch only can work with very limited P-band airborne um, or um, in situ data to develop the algorithms. So that means we are expecting to be able to prove these initial algorithm definitions quite quickly 
once the biomass mission is launched in 2023 and the actual global mission data becomes available. Um, thus far, the improvement and updating step, though, um, here at ESA has presented a challenge, in particular because processing algorithms are generally not publicly accessible. Um, and updating cycles can really take up to years um, until um, improvements are made in these algorithms, um, and hence also improvements are made in the final data product. So, and then third, um, due to the novelty of the biomass mission, um, we'd really like to see um, ideally scientific community formation as early as possible pre-launch to both push um, scientific discovery in, for example, the processing of PBENZAR, as well as uh, scientific discovery really with biomass generated data products, such as global maps of above ground forest biomass, and to really name biomass as a mission A success. So what is Biopal and how does it address these named challenges? Biopal is an open source software project called the Biomass Product Algorithm Laboratory, publicly hosted on GitHub. It's really the first time that um, official processing algorithms from ESA are made publicly available. Um, and as an open source software project, it contains the source code coded in Python for the official biomass algorithms um, generating above ground biomass, forest height for, and forest disturbance from a raw PBENZAR data released under the MIT open source license. So as an open source software project, however, um, Biopal does not only contain these um, prototype processes, but also contains, for example, analysis tool, the tools to analyze um, the uh, maps of biomass. It contains uh, governance structures and contribution guidelines for our scientists or also external contributor, con contributors to um, work together with us. Uh, we've just started packaging and distributing Biopal, so you can, for example, now install it via pip install Biopal. Um, we're working on continuous integration and testing of the source code. We're also working on providing documentation on tutorials that shows how to um, use and work with both uh, the library as a user and also um, as a developer. And for example, we're also um, really working towards supporting um, Biopal to be used in interactive coding environments such as Jupyter to be able um, to, for example, uh, show Biopal in classroom settings um, and educational settings as well. So what are the goals of Biopal? Um, it's really supposed to be an open and collaborative space for the improvement of the currently defined biomass operational processing algorithms. So um, for ESA, we're trying to really accelerate the innovation of um, doing PBENZAR processing and um, additionally, it, Biopal is supposed to act as a bridge between these um, scientific discoveries and the um, innovations in PBENZAR processing and the timely improvement of the official operational processing algorithms. So for, uh, from the agency's perspective, it simplifies um, our operations of the source code and it also allows us to reach superior code quality more quickly. Um, and last but not least, Biopal is from either side thought of as an example or template project, really promoting best practices for open scientific code development and explores for us a new way of doing open and collaborative science that could be implemented for all future Earth Explorer missions. So talking about open source software development, how does this actually look like for Biopal? So first, uh, we have our Biopal project hosted openly on uh, GitHub, 
containing the operational biomass algorithms, containing documentation and tutorials, showcasing how to run these algorithms, and also containing contribution guidelines explaining how changes could be integrated into these um, official operational algorithms. We then invite users and developers to leverage version control in Git um, and clone or download this project to their local workspace. We additionally provide testing and validation data to run the algorithms. More information on how to access these data sets can be found under biopal.org. Or in the future, um, uh, users, or also you, will be able to run these algorithms with real biomass data, for example, accessed by um, other efforts such as the ESA NASA multi mission algorithm and analysis platform that makes the biomass data publicly available. So now that you have the algorithm source code, tutorials, and testing and validation data, you can start running the algorithms on your own on your local workspace, for example, or you can also start making changes to the algorithms, maybe even implement your own algorithm. In the next step, you can now propose to include your changes and improvements within the official Biopal project, again, writing so-called issues or pull requests on GitHub. Proposed changes are then being reviewed by um, officials at ESA and the Biopal core developers like Francesco Banna, Paola um, Mazzucelli. And they can then be approved and merged back into the Biopal project, into the official operational algorithms, really updating um, the algorithms and also ESA's data product. So this signifies a general workflow, how you could contribute to Biopal and how we are currently working on Biopal as well. So how did we approach from an agency perspective, creating Biopal as an open source software project? And what lessons did we learn in the process setting up such an open source software project? Um, so this graph shows you the commit history of Biopal, in particular, the above ground biomass module or processing code as our sparehead module. Um, in orange, it shows you interfaces and maintenance commits here in white and the overall project commit history. So we officially moved the source code of the prototype operational algorithms um, to a private organization in GitHub. Um, just about a year ago in August 2020. And starting out uh, with the scientists and also the developers uh, working together, being, being involved, we realized that um, the current prototype processor source code was not easy to work with um, in its then current form. And we spent, first of all, a couple of months um, <laughs> time to refactor the code base to really make it easier for scientists and um, people with, let's say, not a software development background to work on um, the code, really only focusing on their specific area of expertise, for example, above ground biomass um, processing from PBNSAR data. So we um, modularized uh, the source code a bit better. And after refactoring Biopal into these separate modules, we started also adding more documentation. Our team grew a bit bigger. We decided on governance structures and additionally added um, guidelines for contributions. Um, we then were really set up for the scientists to keep doing um, scientific research um, and continuing to iterate on the above ground biomass processor and um, basically develop the algorithm. Um, then uh, a couple months later, we realized that we needed to refactor the interfaces a bit more to make it easier to read and write data from module to module. So for example, from um, AGB, uh, from forest height into AGB. Um, and we added more API documentation and tutorials on how to run the different processors 
which we needed actually for ourselves as well as um, for um, external contributors um, planning the release to release the Biopel project soon. So afterwards, we started working on adding tests and really setting up a testing infrastructure um, before finally making the repository publicly accessible at the beginning of the year. Since then, we have had first external contributors and bug fixes, as well as also released Biopel on PyPI to allow now installation, for example, via pip install Biopel. So um, what are the lessons we learned at ESA creating such an open source software project? Well, the number one lesson was that creating a successful open source project was not only about um, adding uh, an open source license, but especially about putting measures in place to really create an active community of developers and contributors such as adding guidelines, how to contribute, or tutorials, how to get started, um, as well as inviting interested people directly to our bi-weekly meetings. So the entire team actually learned how valuable common guidelines and practices were, um, and also how valuable it was to be using the same tools in the same space as compared to working separately. Um, with each contributor, each um, institutions that, that worked on the source code uh, um, to be using their own tools and habits. And even though there was a learning curve uh, for most participants and scientists involved at the beginning, it really made uh, working in large distributed teams much easier in the long run. Um, additionally, uh, a centralized communication with GitHub issues really helped tackling issues faster. Um, so each team member um, had a different expertise, um, scientific or software development expertise, and could pitch in when there was um, trouble. Um, it was also interesting to working with people with really different backgrounds and helped um, expanding um, basically our own backgrounds and solving bottlenecks um, uh, concretely and, and also very fast. Um, and even though the project has been opened just recently, the help um, of external contributors was really valuable for improving documentation or also spotting bugs in the code. Um, and through the involvement through the involvement of external contributors, we um, at the agency really already experienced the value of having a centralized software review process set in place also for updating algorithms um, further down the line. Okay, so now you know about Biopal. Um, here I'd like to call you for your contribution if you're excited about software development, open source software or SAR processing. Um, you can find us on GitHub um, or also learn more about Biopal on our website, biopal.org. And in particular, we're currently always really grateful for contributors that are simply testing the library, reporting bugs, or improving API documentation, or simply just sharing the project within uh, a network. If you're in particular interested in development, we're currently actively working on improving the computational performance of the algorithms. We're adding analysis tools for, for example, output data, such as visualization tools, and are always working on tests. And if you're a researcher, we always encourage testing Biopal, for example, on other PBENSAR data sources or integrating also Spaceborne LIDAR as calibration data. So um, feel free to reach out to anyone um, in the team. We're distributed between ESA, DLR, ARESIS, Polytechno, Codi Milano, and Magic Soya Consulting. And of course, um, I'm also still going to be here to answer your questions. Feel free to write me an email or reach out via biopolitisa.int as well. And with this, I say thank you.
And happy thank you for answering questions. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That was fantastic. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that there was an educational context for what you're working on as well, and um, bringing the next uh, next generation into all of these uh, these cool and high impact things. We do have a, a question from the audience for you, and it's about um, measuring the accuracy of the algorithm and how you do this. Was it trained in specific regions? Um, yeah, so we have um, multiple um, algorithms and basically um, different algorithms are currently, um, the output of different algorithms is currently compared to different um, in situ data sets. And that's actually like one of the problems we are facing because we can collect uh, some in situ data sets, but we'll never be able currently to collect um, in situ data sets that are valuable for or valid for all global forests. Um, so this is one of the, the things we hope to improve uh, once the biomass um, data really becomes available. So currently, algorithm outputs are basically optimized on um, in situ measurements. Fantastic, thank you. And I, I've got a question for you as well. So I'm very curious about how you're coordinating the um, the collaborative effort to the code. I'm, I'm curious if you've been running code sprints as part of the the, the big boost forward and in, in development. Um, yeah. So currently, because um, we were uh, basically a small team and there was still a lot of scientific work done on the algorithms. We started on uh, just doing things like peer programming with uh, people that were already involved. Um, code sprints is actually one of the things we're looking forward to do um, in the future, um, but uh, we haven't done them quite yet. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks. 